Our next speaker is Kenneth Schulman. Kenneth is Professor, Department of Psychiatry at Sunnybrook and Women's University of Toronto. Dr. Shulman graduated from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto in 1973 and did postgraduate training in psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He then went on to do specialty training in geriatric psychiatry in London, England. Since 1978, he has been based at Sunnybrook Health Science Centre, University of Toronto, where he has been involved in the development of an academic program in geriatric psychiatry. In 1990, he completed a Master of Science in Health Policy and Management at Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Shulman was formerly the director of the Division of Geriatric Psychiatry at University of Toronto. For 10 years, he served as Psychiatrist-in-Chief at Sunnybrook and Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs of the University of Toronto, Department of Psychiatry. He is the inaugural recipient of the Richard Luar Chair in Geriatric Psychiatry at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre, University of Toronto. Currently, he is the Chief of the Brain Sciences Program at Sunnybrook. I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shulman has had a long-standing interest in the issue of testamentary capacity and vulnerability due to undue influence. He is a frequent pre presenter at continuing legal education seminars and estate litigation and has published several papers on this topic in Canadian and international journals, including the recent review papers in the American Journal of Psychiatry and International Psychogenerics, Psychogeriatrics. Sorry. He has been qualified as an expert witness in estate matters in Ontario and Alberta. Dr. Shulman? Thank you very much. Well, I'm very pleased to be here um, as a physician among lawyers, and, and there are very distinct differences in the, as I'm sure you're aware of, the culture of medicine and the culture of law. Um, one of them is the doctors cannot speak without slides. It, it, I tried yesterday and nothing came out, so I, I told Chuck I needed to have slides today. Um, there are other differences, but um, we, we don't really have time to go into it, but I, I will speak to the slides. So I'm going to talk about uh, an issue that is uh, not infrequently uh, raised in matters of estate litigation and wills, and that's the question of capacity. There is, of course, a presumption of capacity, but uh, there are circumstances in which that capacity is overruled, and, and the question arises, did that person have the requisite mental capacity to execute a will? And um, I guess my colleague behind me is going to have to change my slides because I don't have a clicker. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about some of the reasons uh, where at least I have a perception over the last 20 years, and I don't have hard data on this, show that there's been an increase in the request for contemporaneous assessments, certainly as well as retrospective, but I'm going to focus a little bit on contemporaneous assessments of capacity. And the reason is that um, there, there is an increase in challenges for for a variety of reasons. One is demographics and um, economics. We know that the population is shifting towards an older population, and there's a disproportionate amount of wealth in the hands of the elderly. Notwithstanding the stereotype of the poor old person, there is, in fact, a, a disproportionate amount of wealth in old people. There's going to be a huge transfer of wealth in our generation from that generation. So when you have that, that's a, that's a, a fertile ground for a challenge. Add to that the high prevalence, relatively high prevalence, of mental disorders among old people, particularly dementias, but other psychiatric disorders. Uh, in, in people over the age of 80, the prevalence of dementia is well over 25%. Uh, and a will that's made in that age group is potentially influenced by a mental disorder. Add to that the complexity of modern families that didn't exist 30, 40 years ago, uh, multiple families, multiple interests, uh, the kind of thing that Jordan was just talking about in terms of how, how much is one sibling loved against another, a step-sibling versus biological child. Um, all of these things add up to the fact that there will be more challenges, or likely to be more challenges. And um, what's important, I think, is that there is evidence that the courts put a lot of weight on a contemporaneous, contemporaneous assessment of, a, of capacity, that if somebody sat down and documented the mental state of the individual, the intention, that it was clear, it was rational, um, consistent, that that is a very difficult thing to challenge 
after the fact. And, and that's true even if a lawyer documents that. And, and many of the cases that I've seen over the years, there's been no documentation. It makes, it makes it much easier to question and challenge. But once there's clear documentation, it's a lot harder to do that. And a fortiori, as you lawyers say, when a, a, a medical expert or a psychiatric expert provides documentation, that would be uh, very good armor against a will challenge. Now, in the next uh, slide, I'm going to just list some of the circumstances that suggest that it might be worth uh, assessing the capacity of an individual. Um, one is when there's a dramatic change from uh, prior expressed wishes, especially when it's been a consistent wish expressed over many years and suddenly late in life, um, or a deathbed will. Uh, where there's a dramatic change, that creates some concern about the capacity of the individual or the influence that that individual has been subjected to, where there's been so-called unnatural provision, something very strange, uh, you know, um, raises uh, eyebrows, uh, perhaps there should be a check of mental capacity or where there's a known presence of a mental disorder. Somebody is known to have a psychiatric or cognitive disorder. Those are the circumstances that you want to have careful uh, documentation and perhaps also even a, a situation where you have some sense that there's going to be a challenge and you want to protect that uh, will and protect the wishes of the individual. That's the time to do an assessment. Next slide. Let's just skip to the, to the next one. Um, I, I'm very, I've become... Um, I'm not sure what the right turn is, chastened over the years about my role as a physician. You know, we are, physicians grow up within the world of medicine. We're in charge. We call the shots. When I appear in court, I've had to come to the realization that it's not my home stadium. I'm, I'm in the stadium of the law. The, the judge is in charge. And I'm there as a guest uh, and as a witness. And my opinion is only one opinion. I might be expert A or B, and that might be a very different opinion that the court has to consider. So that's one issue. Uh, there are other witnesses. Uh, the medical opinion about capacity is not the only opinion. Some judgments and some uh, uh, courts in the past have actually disparaged the expert who has never seen uh, the testator or the testatrix. Uh, although, as I said, a contemporary assessment is much more powerful. And then there are legal precedents and principles that have to be applied. So it's complicated. When a medical expert comes before the court, you're offering a clinical opinion. And I hasten to add that to all of my opinions. This is a clinical opinion. And it's the judge, uh, clearly, who has the final say in these matters. In the next slide, I just want to talk about uh, the general principles of capacity assessment. I know that we're talking about different jurisdictions today. That's the theme. And I have to say, when I thought about this and reviewed this issue, there are many more similarities than differences in international jurisdictions on the question of capacity uh, and undue influence. There are some subtle differences, and I'll talk about those. But uh, I've been involved in an international group. And whether you're in Australia, England, Canada, Israel, there are a lot more similarities to the issue of capacity. And here are the general principles of any mental capacity. Number one, you have to understand relevant facts to the capacity in question. You have to be able to appreciate the consequences of taking or not taking specific actions. So this can apply to uh, capacity to consent to treatment, capacity to manage your financial affairs. And all capacities are task specific. That's an important principle. There's no such thing as a global capacity or somebody's totally incapable unless it's, you know, they're in a vegetative state. But in most cases, you have to assess each capacity in its own right. And more than that, each specific capacity has to be understood in the context of each individual situation, which differs. So you could have the same person with the same mental capacity, mental state, brain, if you like, and put them in different situations, and they may or may not be capable depending on the situation. That's an important principle to understand. And ultimately, you want to determine when you're doing a capacity assessment, can individual manipulate information rationally? Can they tell you in a logical, coherent, rational way what their intentions are? And let's just uh, skip to the one after this. Uh, the, the traditional criteria, the ones, it's an English case law, 19th century, known as Banks v. Goodfellow, 
and I don't, have, I don't have time to go into the details of that case. But these are the essential components historically of what's involved in determining if somebody's capable. Do they know about the act or know what a will is? Do they know the extent of their assets? Now, extent of assets has, has changed. In, in, in 19th century law, uh, there was a big difference in what you owned compared to today. It's a lot more complicated. And the courts have taken the position that knowledge of assets can be in a general way rather than knowing exactly which account you had how much money in. Um, and that's an interesting uh, aspect of that knowledge. Um, again, the, the, the English term natural objects of bounty, meaning who your family is, who would normally expect uh, to um, inherit from you, and, and we've heard about some of the promises to people that have been made. You have to know more or less what the distribution of the assets are and the impact, the potential impact that they're going to have on people. So these are all uh, elements of testamentary capacity. And then there's this rider that says you have to be free of delusions. <clears throat> so this is a, a psychiatric term as to what is a delusion, and there's a, a legal term for insane delusion. There's a medical definition. <clears throat> Sometimes the two aren't necessarily congruent, but a delusion in medical terms is a fixed false belief and then there's a writer that's out of keeping with your educational, cultural, or religious background. Otherwise, a lot of religious beliefs would be called delusions. So we have to be careful about that part. Um, let's just go back. For, uh, to go back one slide. So in, in this slide, I've tried to illustrate <clears throat> the relationship between situation complexity, which is what we call the x-axis in the bottom, and the level of cognition or emotional stability. So <clears throat> I'm trying to demonstrate this interplay, this interrelationship between mental state and how complex your environment is. Um, do I have a, I don't have a pointer here, do I? Uh, Chuck's got everything, very good. So what I've tried to show here is that in a, um, in a situation where somebody has high cognition, somebody's, you know, completely intact, doesn't matter how complex their environment is, they would generally be considered to be capable. Somebody who's impaired or emotionally unstable, if their um, situation, their milieu becomes complicated, it's a lot easier for them to shift from a low level of cognition into the incapable sphere. So I, I've put it a bit of a blurred line here. This is, you know, the law, unlike medicine, is black and white. In, in medicine, we, we have uh, shades of gray, but when you go to court, you're either right or you're wrong. That's the end of it. You're either capable or you're incapable, and somewhere you fall somewhere along this line on either side here. So again, high intact cognition, <coughs> very hard to be considered incapable. Low cognition, it depends on the level of conflict and complexity of your environment. So if the children are fighting and trying to influence you and you're impaired, you're going to have a hard time weighing competing claims on, on your estate and in your assets. <coughs> if you can't do that, if you can't sort that out, from a clinical point of view, certainly, you could be considered incapable. So those are the sort of challenges that we have. Let's go on. <coughs> 